a little overwhelmed at how many people are here. I welcome all of you to the University of West Florida, which is on a different track than it was before and is going places. Whether we have the resources or not, no matter which way the wind blows, you have simply got to keep the course. Um, I was told you I should tell you my story. I think most of you know my story, but I will give you some highlights. Um, I, uh, I come from uh, Panama City, but I was born in New Jersey. My uh, father uh, was a dairy farmer, and in New Jersey, uh, dairy farming is, uh, uh, um, it was popular, but the land has always been very expensive because where we come from is close to New York City, and so uh, they were leasing farms instead of buying. And in uh, 1950, uh, the, a few uh, young farmers were frustrated by that. And they set out in their car to find a place where they could buy farms uh, instead of lease them. And they wound up in Bay County, Florida. And uh, my dad uh, bought, uh, and mom, bought uh, 300 plus acres uh, uh, about 10 miles north of Panama City and his his friend bought uh, about less acres, but at any rate, a farm in a little community called Lynn Haven. And there were no Yankees in Bay County. We spoke different. Uh, I was six when we moved in 1951. Uh, my brother Chris was uh, two, and uh, my brother Alan, which most of you know, uh, was, uh, came along soon. But the, uh, and we were uh, a farming family, and in a farming family, um, uh, it is a partnership between the husband and the wife and the children. And being the oldest, I got to do the assisting uh, first. And it was my pleasure to hose out the dairy barn to help dad uh, deliver uh, milk bottles to the doorstep, to bottle the milk, and to uh, uh, have coffee in the middle of the milk delivery and uh, uh, get up early, work late, and I learned how to work hard. I also saw him fail, because it was at that time, about 1955, that uh, a couple of laws were put in. One was pasteurization of milk, and another was putting milk in the grocery stores, and the corporization of uh, the dairy industry, and that drove almost all of the dairy farmers out of business. And so as the price of milk dropped and the milk routes failed, we poured our milk out on the ground. You have to milk cows and you have, to, um, uh, you have to feed them. And as we milked our cows and poured it on the ground, and my dad went and milked, crow, uh, milked other people's cows for money, I realized that defeat is a terrible thing and that you have to deal with adversity. Of course, they got a job. They, uh, they had to go to work in town, and, uh, and then we began to move around. But we learned uh, from that as a, a close-knit family from somewhere else that uh, uh, you uh, have to learn how to pick yourself up and dust yourself off even when the one thing you love you can't do. Um, so uh, I, uh, I learned also about competition and uh, that you have to adjust. One of the things also is that I, um, I began to, uh, as a young person, uh, I began to realize uh, that uh, I was a curious person. I was always curious about why things work. Why, why do we have these kinds of dairy cows? Why do we have uh, these rivers here? What, what has been here before us? Because there certainly always has been something before us. And I began to uh, have an interest in the past and as an explanation of the present. Because if you have the problem with the whys, you have to go into the past because you certainly can't go into the future. Uh, my mother was a, uh, uh, a strong-willed person and uh, was very demanding. And both my brother Alan and I point to her as the person who gave us our fierceness, our ability not to be afraid, our ability to uh, shoot for the top. Because if we didn't uh, get an A, we wanted, she wanted to know exactly why we didn't get an A and uh, why we had any other goals than to be number one. And uh, so from our father, we got the, uh, the uh, what? The characteristic of trying to be nice. 
Uh, you do get more flies with honey uh, than vinegar. And so the combination of them lives on in us, uh, and it is a very helpful. So that's the early beginnings, hard work, seeing failure, seeing them recover, and uh, knowing that, uh, uh, that uh, you, uh, we have choices in life. Now, one of the things that has been also ingrained on me and many people my age is a college education. Most of us that were in secondary school and grew up in the 50s and the early 60s were expected to go to college. If we didn't go to college, uh, there was something wrong with us. And not everyone should go to college, but uh, it, was, uh, it was very important. And I think if I had anything to do over again or identify the most important thing that I ever did in my life, it was get a college education. And I would do it again in a minute. Of course, I knew I wanted to be an archeologist um, uh, uh, early on. Uh, we used to have something, in fact, it still exists, in, uh, uh, in our elementary school where we were barefoot and uh, had many grades in one room. Uh, they have something called the Weekly Reader. And the Weekly Reader had the latest stuff. And uh, I remember when uh, Dr. Leakey in Africa uh, began to discover our, uh, our ancestors that were a million years old, uh, that were two million years old, when radiocarbon dating began to, uh, was, was developed. And I, I was just fascinated by the length of our story and, and how different we are from those early beginnings and how similar we are. And I got intrigued with the world of archeology span and mainly because the things that they are finding and that they were finding and continue to find were the real McCoy. They weren't something that somebody described or what a historical document said. It was the real stone tool. The stone tool that if you picked up made the difference between you and the non-human things in this world. If you had a stone ax, you could skin an antelope in 15 minutes and be cooking dinner in 30 minutes while the person without a tool was trying to rip the skin apart with their teeth. Once we began to use artifacts and tools, we have never let them go. And in my early lifetime, there were things like the space shuttle and Sputnik and looking at other worlds. Those are the things that, that sort of piqued my intellectual curiosity. And by 26, I had a PhD. And I was educated in the, in the sort of the details, if you will, of how we go about learning from the past. And during the 60s, when I was in college, uh, asking a lot of questions. Uh, those of us that were in college in the 60s began to see changes in women's roles, in men's roles, and in thinking that had never been, our mothers never experienced. Uh, questioning authority. Uh, breaking the rules, not paying attention to what we were supposed to do, but instead paying attention to what we wanted to do and finding a path to go there. I never doubted that I could be an archeologist. I never doubted that I could get a PhD. Um, people just sort of looked at me funny when I said that's what I was going to do, uh, but that was all right with me. It never really occurred to me as a young person that I couldn't succeed. And I don't know really where I got that or where my brother got that. It was something that was given to us by our parents, I'm sure. And it, is, um, it really never occurred to me because actually failure is so embarrassing and it is so self-defeating that I will do almost anything not to fail. I will compromise, I will take, uh, I will take time, but failure is terrible. And I have come close to failing a couple of times, and I have laid it on the line a couple of times. Uh, but uh, when you do that, you seem to work harder. Um, uh, so I did wonder whether I was smart enough. You don't know how smart you are when you come from Panama City. You don't. You know, uh, <laughs> I, you know you're the smartest, one of the smartest ones around, but what does that mean? You know, and so you get to a place like Florida State, and, and I kept up. I, I was right there at the top. But what does that mean? It was a relatively small school at the time with a very losing football team. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, but when I got to Washington State, uh, I got into a program that was nothing but smarties. It was a hand-picked program uh, uh, for particular kinds of archaeology doctoral students. 
And I kept worrying and overstudying, and, and people kept, it, why are you working, so, studying so hard? And the answer was I was afraid of failure, and I was the first one to finish. The first one. And every time I looked over my shoulder, they were all there. And that gave me a lot of confidence. It didn't mean I was the smartest one. I think working hard is as important as being intelligent and, and being, I saw a lot of people who were a lot smarter than me, who were geniuses, who could, didn't have to study and could make an A on the test. I had to study a lot. Uh, but it was the hard work ethic, I think, that brought me uh, uh, at least to uh, the front part of the pack every time. And that has served me well. Uh, I've often heard women say they have to work harder than men. I don't know if that's true or not. I see men working real hard, too. Uh, but I do know that hard work is very important. And in the early days of my career, and now in the later days of my career, hard work is what uh, uh, really is uh, the most important, because everyone in the room is smart. That's kind of your ticket. Everyone's already smart. Everybody's got a PhD. Everybody is successful. Now what? How do, you, how do you distance yourself? How do you separate yourself out? And part of that is hard work. Another one is being clever. Another one is identifying opportunities along the way. Now, the next phase of my life was kind of, what? It was kind of disappointing, and it was a shock. Um, uh, first of all, both my parents dropped dead in their mid-40s of natural causes. And so I began to realize how short life could be. You didn't ever know how much time you had. And when you're in your 20s, you don't think about dying. You don't think about your parents dying. You, don't, you think about your grandparents dying. And uh, so when they both died uh, uh, so quickly, uh, one from a stroke and one from a heart attack, uh, my, uh, um, uh, then our middle brother died. And it left Alan and I together. And we, what we really did in compensation for that, or as a result of that, is pick up the pace. And we picked it up. We also realized, to if you don't like what you're doing, stop it. Change. Don't wait things out that are not worth waiting for. Don't put up and waste time on what you can't win. I was at the University of Alabama. I had a great job after I was in business to uh, take care of the family while the brothers were in uh, finishing college. Uh, but I was there, and the University of Alabama is a great place. Uh, the Bear was coaching. It was a wonderful football team, and it was everything I ever dreamed of. Uh, it has a long tradition of archaeology program. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it was a, 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 a storied uh, a program and had some of the greats in it. And I was miserable. The only woman there was the secretary. And women weren't supposed to do archaeology there. They, it was a good old boys game. And they meant it. And I learned how to, what? How to refuse to do things to my boss. I'm not going to take the worst truck. I want the new one. You need me as much as I need you. He needed me for a big job. And the only reason they got that job was because I was running it. And I began to understand leverage. So I got what I wanted. I didn't want to, yes, and I, and I meant it. They wanted to put me off in the old uh, lab down by the Moundville, and I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be on the main campus and the heart of campus, and I wanted my own lab, and I wanted it this way. And they said, uh, OK, uh, we'll do that. And I brought home the bacon. I mean, I did my part, too. I, it was a terrible winter. It was a horrible project. It was the most, the, you talk about landing on the line. It was a winter like this one we're having, only 300 miles north. Every day it sleeted. Every night it froze. And I went through, I think, 100 people to keep a crew of 15 working throughout the winter of uh, 1978. Um, so. I realized, though, that if I stayed at the University of Alabama, I was going to have to show them that women can do this. Now, did I want to do that, or did I want to practice archaeology? And I decided that I was going to practice archaeology. 
because I was in my 30s, and I didn't know how long I was going to live, and I, that's what I wanted to do. And I looked around at other institutions and talked around to other, uh, uh, my friends at other institutions and found that research won large institutions with, with developed archaeology programs um, were all the same in a way. They were all having the same problem I was having. So I thought, oh. What about going into business? Archaeology, as a consulting firm, the laws have been passed along with the environmental laws that made archaeology required for federally funded or permitted projects. So there was a lot of private business out there for the first time. And people were starting their own businesses in archaeology consulting. But that's doing archaeology for money. And they were chasing money as people have to do in business. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that isn't why I did archaeology. So I began to realize that what I really needed was a place with a clean slate, a place that didn't know what archaeology was, but had good archaeology, and they didn't even know it. So when I came to the University of West Florida, I was a walk-on. There was no job. There was no desire to have anthropology and archaeology, and they didn't quite know what it was. And that's exactly what I wanted. I did have a contract, a big one, in my pocket, and I leveraged that as a, when you have a $2 million project and the overhead is half a million dollars, uh, that said a lot in 1980 or 79, really, when I was dickering with this. And, uh, uh, and uh, it, it meant a lot. The school had 4,000 students. Uh, they had a sociology department. And uh, they had talked about anthropology. And, uh, and I, I said, you know, I really do have this contract in hand. Uh, it wasn't signed yet. And, I'd like to, uh, how would you like to, to sponsor me and for me to build an archaeology and anthropology program at UWF? I found a guy named Dallas Blanchard, who was the head of the sociology department, and he, was, uh, he said, I'll, I'll sponsor you, Judy. And I said, all right. And so uh, we went uh, uh, to the uh, uh, dean, and we went to the provost and asked them if it was all right with them, and they said yes. And I said, well, I really want to start an anthropology department, so if I bring this project here, I want your guarantee that we'll have a couple of uh, faculty positions. Okay. Uh, and also, you know, I, um, I want to have a, a bachelor's program within X number of years. I said, okay. And, and I also want to be in Building 13 because I want to be right next to the president's office because out of sight is out of mind. <laughs> they said, okay. <laughs> and I, I took uh, Dr. Blanchard aside and said, Dallas, why are they saying yes? He said, because they don't think you'll get it. I said, that makes great sense. I said, don't you know this is sole sourced? They said, they don't believe you. You know, you're 30-something. You think you have this big project, and they're just saying yes. You take all their agreements, and you staple them to the proposal that you send into the Corps of Engineers. So when it is approved, then they have to give you what they said they would. I said, all right. And of course, I got it. Uh, and uh, and they uh, they were true to most of what, I got most of what they said they would give me, uh, and it was a success. And when people asked me, "Is being president the hardest thing I've ever done?" the answer is absolutely not. That was the hardest thing I ever did, because if I failed at those projects, it would ruin my career. Those are make or breakers. And when you're young and you're in the first third of your career, if you're lucky enough to have a full life. You lay it on the line much more than, for me, than I've laid it on the line afterwards. As president, you have an extreme amount of support. Uh, they schedule for you. They, they feed you. They, they, <laughs> you're traveling as a five star. I mean, there's all kinds of, of support. Back then, I was a chief cook, bottle washer, and I didn't mind one bit because I knew that if I succeeded here, that I could do something that no one else had ever tried. And that is to make what I was interested in intellectually relevant to my community. That's something I learned from the 60s. The, the, the product of your life and the product of your mind should be, um, uh, should be uh, 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 relevant to the place that you live. You, it should be better off because you have been there than it was before. And I live that every day. Uh, I think about it every day. Another one is principle, is to be kind and gentle 
with your colleagues, to work as a team. That is not the way most university units work. It is a, uh, an individual sport. In most intellectual circles, it is all about you and your publications and your grants and your students and your this and your that and your this. And it is a competition between faculty that I did not like. I wanted to work with faculty and hire people that understood that when I made a mistake, they were there to pick it up and I was there for them. It is, I think, a feminine trait to be more of a team player than, uh, than uh, men who are raised and I think programmed to be very competitive. But being competitive is important, but not with each other. I'm competitive with the rest of the world. <laughs> Another one, and so what really happened is, is um, of course, I ran out of the money. You know, you get these grants and contracts and you spend it and you run out. And I knew it was gonna run out the day I walked on campus. And I had to figure out how I was gonna get the rest of the money uh, and sustaining money. And so the thing that I really began to do was to look around Pensacola and see what people were interested in. I really began to adjust my research interests to what people were interested in in Pensacola. And I quickly learned people were interested in their history here. We have a long colonial history. What did I know about history? Nothing. I was interested in six to 8,000 years ago and how people adapted to climatic shifts and uh, the, uh, the uh, social organization of ancient cultures. And I did not even study American history. I rejected it. We called it tin can archeology span and we laughed at it. <laughs> But I realized that I was going to starve to death if all I did was practice my little elite branch of archaeology. So I began to read history. I began to suck up to the history department. I began to realize with a man named Bill Coker that it was really quite interesting. And they began to do urban renewal downtown in the 80s in Pensacola. And they were building new buildings and repaving the street and putting in new utilities and doing all kinds of things. And they were, of course, uncovering incredible artifacts that I had no clue what they were. And they would call me and say, would you come down and help? And I said, I can't, I don't know anything about it. About the 10th call, I realized, actually, when they built City Hall, where it is today, it used to be in what is now the T.T. Wentworth Museum. When they built City Hall, one Sunday afternoon, they, they had dug the footprint. One Sunday afternoon, a beautiful fall day, one of my students called me in 1984 and said, Dr. Bentz, uh, we're down at where they're building a new city hall and there are looters here from Alabama and they're digging up and taking uh, artifacts from these incredible features. And, uh, and uh, we, we claimed one and we're excavating it and we don't know how would you come and help us. And I said, all right, I'll come down, even though I knew nothing about it. Um, and I stood on that pile and I looked at the footprint of city hall and I saw, I saw the destruction of Pensacola's archaeology, the burning of Rome, and everybody was playing the violin. And I thought, I know better. I know this is wrong. I can learn about history, and I can learn about these artifacts. It is my responsibility as an archaeologist in this community to help. And we did. I jumped in there. We helped. And I realized that people can care. And I realized that people, that the, to leverage the power of archaeology, the city fathers, they were all fathers then, the city fathers did not know what they were doing, and I did not hold it against them. I went and I told them and held artifacts up to them in the city council and in the county commission and in the planning boards. And I said, this is 500 years old. This is incredible. It is right here in the street. I'm more surprised than anybody else. I thought it was all gone too. And they got the fever. And they realized I wasn't going away. And I was nice about it, but I was pushy. I said, you should not do this. This is all of our heritage. And I began to realize how many people did not listen to my lectures, how many people did not read my books, how many people <laughs> did not hear it. And then I began to think about who did. What, what were people listening to? They listened to the radio. What were people watching? They were watching television. What were people reading? They were reading the newspaper. 
So I realized quickly that that had to be my media or me, uh, for educating the public, not the students, but the public about archaeology. My message was very clear. It's very simple. Archaeology is here in Pensacola, and it is good for us. It is something money can't buy. It's ours. We own it, and we have a responsibility to at least consider it as we grow and develop. It worked. Unearthing Pensacola is still on NPR, and I still do it because people will forget. Out of sight, out of mind. Another thing. During my parents' generation and before, academics and people with PhDs had been aloof. We had been elite. We had done our research for each other. My professors told me, stay away from the public. Do not tell them what you are doing because they will not understand it. Don't tell them where your sites are because they will go and they will loot them. Do not tell anyone about our secrets. And that is still the prevailing attitude among most academic archaeologists. And I thought that was wrong, because what we were doing with that attitude was fiddling while Rome burned. And I'll be darned if I'm going to go to my grave doing that. And so I began to do, I began to include the public in digging, include the public in the labs, include the public in the writing, include the paper in the reporting. Never ignoring, always doing the scientific part. But I was going to do that anyway. But it is, it was, it's called public archaeology now. And we were one of the founding uh, programs. And it still is one of our greatest strengths. It was using, it was also finding an empty niche that had not been done before when I gave papers and wrote books about that. And I also was a scientific and academic archaeologist. People listened. So it was an opportunity. It was also part of my value system that I couldn't stand to see something destroyed without at least trying to help it. And uh, it also was because I was broke and I needed the volunteers. I told the city I would do a survey of city-owned property, and they said, uh, uh, how much? And I was in front of them on a Tuesday night. And I said, $10,000, and they said, sold. And I thought, oh, my God. And, you know, your career's on the line. You don't have any, you know, uh, any, anything to fall back on. And so uh, I realized that I uh, couldn't afford it. So I put an ad in the paper in the employment wanted column. And I said, if you are unemployed and if you are uh, healthy and if you want to do something interesting while you're uh, looking for work, Come join me in an archaeological project downtown Pensacola. All I require is one full day at a time. Worked like a charm. <laughs> I had all the people I wanted. I had my little undergraduates teaching the volunteers, and it was like a Pied Piper. And that is uh, successful. And I learned there that they can help you. They can really do archaeology. You don't have to have a degree. What you, they need is good supervision. What they need is to be talked to like an intelligent person. These kinds of, this kind of an approach is really the secret to archaeological success and the secret to my success here in Pensacola. It took me eight years before I got a steady paycheck. Uh, nobody wanted to pay me. I was told to go away, not come back. If I had money, I wouldn't give it to you. One of the presidents told me that. And um, I, uh, uh, I didn't know what to do, so I called some people with gray hair, and I said, you know, uh, I, I don't, the light went out at the end of the tunnel. And I got asked political questions. How's your president doing? I said, what do you mean how my president is? My president just told me to go away. <laughs> no, how's the president doing? I said, well, there have been some bad articles in the paper. Uh, how old is he? And I said, he's in his 60s. So what? I don't like him. <laughs> what about the other one that's giving you trouble? I said, he's old too. <laughs> and we began to have this conversation. And I was told to wait. Go get a good old archaeological project. You got more archaeology in Pensacola you could do in 10 lifetimes. Go get another grant. Wait him out. And sure enough, boom, 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 they all left. 
And they said, get on the search committees and nobody will ask you. I said, OK, OK, I'll, I'll find a way to muscle my way in. And, and I did. Uh, and so uh, uh, I uh, uh, about, uh, I would say it took nine or 10 years before the program really began to be appreciated. And uh, this is one of the, uh, finally, Morris, uh, uh, President Marx uh, 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 um, supported me and gave me a chance. And uh, one of the things he told me is he said, Judy, I can't tell you no. He says, if I tell you no, everybody's going to know it. <laughs> and it's going to be me, my fault, his fault. And I said, well, Morris, I'm not going to go around bad math. And yeah, I know you're the president, you know, and, and if you say no, I'll, I'll just come back. But I mean, you know, I, uh, and they said, he said, oh, no, we have got to do this. I said, thank you. Thank you. So we began to then, I began to realize that the power of archaeology is really the power of the press and the power of the people. What I was able to do was to share the glitz to share the magic of, of our unearthing our past with everyone, students, but also the public, and begin to force a program into a university from the outside in. That's exactly the opposite of the way it is normally done. And, um, and my friends and colleagues, when I left Alabama and came here, thought I had lost my mind. And I was very well educated. I really did do archaeology well. And why would I leave the storied program in the southeastern United States and sitting on top of their research program? And then 15 years later was, how did you know to do that? What, ticked you, what, what tipped you off, Judy? And I, what tipped me off was there was nobody's baggage I had to carry, nobody's mess I had to clean up, and great resources here. It's just like football. There are, there's a, resources are deep right here that money can't buy. All you really need to do is to figure out how to tap them and adjust to them. Had I stuck with my little niche in archaeology that I was trained in in the Research One institutions, uh, I would have starved to death and had to go back or to quit. But with all of the times when it was, the program was vulnerable, I really realized that you just had to keep going. One of the things, and I will only tell you uh, one other story, my, when I got to Washington State, I, had, uh, I was uh, homesick the first week. And I remember going to a phone booth and calling my mother, and I was crying. I never cried, and I was crying. I said, Mom, I'm, this is terrible. I made a terrible mistake. I want to come home. She said, sure. Come on, Judy. Quit. Come on, sure, come on back home. Everybody know you quit, but you know, come on back home. And by the end of the conversation, I was mad at her. I'd stopped crying, and I was gonna finish first. And so it is the, uh, that was a big lesson to me. I knew what was going on at the time. I knew she was calling my bluff and making me feel bad and knowing that quitting, anyone can quit. She said that to me a million times. Anyone can quit, Judy. And it's true. Quitting is easier. My life would have been easier. I wouldn't have had all these problems. I wouldn't have had all these insecurities and all this stuff on the line. But man, I would have done it as a quitter. And I just couldn't take it. This program could have crashed and burned at any one time. But it didn't. Because when your back is against the wall, humans, especially intelligent, well-educated humans, can come up with a solution. Right now, at this point in time, these kinds of universities are under the greatest pressure of all. Mid-sized publics. Privates, you could argue, small privates are under worse pressure. But sure, we could quit. We could say, yeah, you know, we're just not, we're just going to give up and die. But you know what? That's just not right. And so that particular attitude, this don't quit. I remember when I began to be successful, uh, one of my uh, a former uh, provosts said to me, you know that this thing about Judy Benz, you tell her no, and she, she just won't take no for an answer. I said, no, yes, I do take no for an answer. But I just come back with another pitch. 
right for the same thing. And you've got to continue for you, for you young people in the room. Got to, do not take no for an answer to getting what you want. Just take no that they, the boss, whoever it is, is in control, doesn't want to do it this way. When I learn one of the powers on how to, how to, um, what's the right word? How to, um, how to deal with a president. <laughs> I began to look at the president and figure out what his problems are. What are the problems of a president? And one of the problems is good PR, bad PR. They need to be in the limelight. And so I began to say, Judy, why don't you invite the president to groundbreakings? Well, who, I break ground all the time. Why don't you have him uh, hold this object? Why don't you have him at your news conferences, press conferences, all of these things? And I did. And he was much happier. <laughs> and began, they began to realize that archaeology was good for the university for its PR. And I am, uh, I, I, and that is kind of using archaeology, but in, in the same sense, I was still doing good archaeology. We never sacrifice the archaeology for, uh, for the glitz. You can have both. So there I was uh, in, 19, in 2008. I was 63. I was on my way to retirement. I had my exit plan. I had everything figured out. I was getting lifetime achievement awards in archaeology. I was writing my seminal work. I was doing ground, what, what would you call it, way ahead of the curve work in Mexico. And, and it was turning out perfectly. And uh, I was coming back from Veracruz, and I was sitting on the plane, and I was catching up on the news at home, and I heard President Kavanaugh was leaving. And I thought, wait a minute, he, he just got his contract renewed and is making big, month, big bucks. And I thought, oh, no, now I've got to break in another president, so now we've got to go through all of this. And, and then he's going to bring in new vice presidents and uh, a new provost. And I said, uh, yeah, all right, all right, I guess, that, you know, what are you going to do? And I was, uh, I was underneath the dean, and uh, I was uh, kind of a glorified department chair. And, um, so I get off the plane, and I'm tired. I've been there for a long time, and, and my phone begins to ring. And it, I didn't answer it for a while because I was tired. And uh, finally, I uh, recognized the person that was calling me and, and the number, and I, it was before cell phones, and I was, well, it wasn't either, but at any rate. Um, <laughs> they said, you know, uh, we, we need an interim. Kavanaugh is leaving, and uh, there's, he, he needs to go right away. Uh, and uh, we need someone to fill in before we do a search uh, for, a real, for a permanent president. Would you do it? And I said, absolutely not. Why would I do that? And they, then somebody else called, and somebody else called, and finally all the deans brought me in. And they turned, off the, turned down the lights and put me on a low seat, and they were all surrounding me. <laughs> And deans are, I mean, you know, they're your life when you're, when you're below a dean. And they said, you need to do this, Judy. You need to do this for the university. You need to be the interim. And I said, well, for the past 15 years, the university's been pretty good to me. And uh, uh, I, I would consider it. And boy, that's all it took. And um, Ed, well, where's Ed Rinelli? Uh, uh, yes, Ed uh, was there with me. And then, uh, then uh, uh, Ed got in the race, and we began to, they wanted somebody internal, nobody external. We went before a quick search committee, and, and Ed and I looked at each other and said, I hope you get it. <laughs> <laughs> and Ed said, I hope you get it, and, I, and, and we were, you know, just, just kind of filling in. And, we, and, and I, we said, all right, we'll fill in. And so it was a close vote. I mean, you know, it could have been him or me. And so uh, uh, they said, me and I said, all right. And they said, and you're also not eligible to uh, uh, to to be a candidate for the permanent presidency. I said, all right, all right. Well, we knew that going in, and um, uh, so uh, that was in 2008. And so I had nine months. And then what began to happen is I realized for the first time, that, no, for the third time in my life, I was in the deep end of the pool. And I mean the deep end of the pool. 
the recession hit, the budget cuts started, the, uh, the nervousness ramped up, the legislature didn't know what to do. Uh, we were cut eventually 47% of our state support and uh, our enrollment was, uh, uh, was shaky. And so we could do two things. We could just roll over and take it and say, yep, it was a, it's been a good ride. We'll just be absorbed by Florida State University. They've been trying to get us for a long time. Or we could roll up our shirt sleeves and, by God, grow enrollment and get this place where it ought to be. And so in the recession, they said, well, will you stay one more year? I said, yeah, I'll stay one more year. Okay, I'm not going to forget too much in two years. And, uh, and then uh, uh, we began to grow. We began to succeed despite the cuts. People began to realize that we had this university in our hands. This is our university. Nobody cares about Northwest Florida in the rest of the state. They don't know what time it is here, and they don't care. <laughs> they don't care whether we win or lose, and they all like all of our money. And so, what's new? We had to bail ourselves out. And we rolled up our short sleeves, and we are twice as big, we are twice as strong, and we are going to be, we are on a path of success. The lights get dim every once in a while, but you can always quit. You can always give up, but it's too good to give up. This university is a special place. It has special students, it has special people, and we are not perfect. But by gosh, we are going to get to the finish line. We're going to have a football team. We're going to have a university park. We're going to have what everybody else has had for 20 years. And people began to realize that. I said, your classes are going to be more full. You're going to have to teach more students. And that's going to get uh, the money so we can hire uh, more professors. And it's going to roll like that. Every other year, you're going to, have, uh, 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 you're going to need more professors because we're going to grow. And this is the way that we are approaching the University of West Florida. Now you will hear the rank and file be optimistic because anyone can quit. That is the alternative, and that is not acceptable. No, I don't know how we'll get out of all of this. I don't, but I do know that with a provost like Martha Saunders, who also has come back to the university and given the last shot in her life to this university because it's the right thing to do, because without this kind of experience and tenacity, it could die. No matter how big it is, you're never too big to fail. And we have got to pay attention, and we are paying attention. And so this sort of approach to life I think has been what has been at least a good part of uh, my success. I never paid much attention to the fact that I was a woman. In fact, I thought this would be the last university to ever have a woman president because it is in the southern culture part of the state and it is a, uh, it, it is a, a man's world here. And then they asked me and I thought, well, it's just me. Uh, uh, it, and it's temporary, you know, I'm just, I'm just a, a sub. And it's not. I realized that they were and, and continue to ask me and the Board of Trustees continues to keep, uh, to keep me as president because of what I do, of how I do it, of the goals and the results of what we are doing. It doesn't matter that you're a woman. I never paid too much attention to it and I probably never will because what counts is what you do. Now, the fact that we do have a lot of female leadership in this university is fine, but it still doesn't matter. What matters is what we do and how we beat the odds that are always stacked against us. That's what matters. How, much, how we handle our money, the decisions that we make. If I make a bad decision, it's not because I'm a woman. It's because I made a bad decision, and I better get over it and fix it and admit it. So this is the, I think, for the... the the younger people in the room, I think that is the kind of approach that at least has been one avenue of success.
It is so easy to give up. It is so easy to say, how do I raise children and have a job and have a spouse? How, how do I handle $200 million budget? And if I fail, it will ruin my career. You just do it. Because if you don't, you will be known as a quitter and as a failure. And that's the bottom line. And so when I reach the end of my days, I will know that I tried as hard as I could and that failure was not an option. And so it is important that we all think about that every day. Because every day there's a good reason to lay down and rest. Every day there's a good reason to whine and complain. Now I go kick the can just like everybody else too. But um, uh, it is important. And, that I, and that's what I wanted to share with you. Not really the details but of, of my life, but kind of the approach that is successful in this country. You find what's sellable, you find what's doable, and you follow it. I followed the money, I followed the interest in history, I followed the glitz that archaeology already had in National Geographic and television, and showed people that is right here and you can touch it, and if you'd like to help me dig it up, you can. <laughs> that's, that's, that's common sense in hindsight. But it was different in foresight when I was doing it. And people thought that I was cheapening archaeology and that I wasn't, I wasn't playing by the rules, and they were right. So um, uh, that is uh, uh, my message to you today. I want to thank all of you for coming and listening to this. I want you to go out and do good work, not just because you're a woman. Go out and do good work because the alternative really is not very good. And I, 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 well, there is one something that came up yesterday. Somebody told me, she said, you know, it took a woman to start football at the University of West Florida. <laughs> and they're right. <laughs>